Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of thefutureofads.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss topics, trends, tactics, and tools related to social, local, and mobile marketing and advertising. Our goal is to give you the information you need to be a better marketer. Today is Tuesday, November 13th, 2012, and this is episode number 45. In this episode, we're going to discuss how much small businesses spend on social media, what you should consider when picking a platform, how to launch a business with Launch Rock, Facebook testing ranked comments, and much more. Hey, Corey, how you doing? I am doing well. How's it going, Adam? Uh, I'm I'm across the world and uh, and and uh, getting over suffering from many ailments. Uh, it's been a fun week since our last show. Uh, I uh, I don't know what happened, but I had stomach issues and then uh, got a, had a cold that I'm getting over. That's why my voice is even deeper than usual. And then ended up like popping a blood vessel in my eye, so I look like I'm starting to turn into a zombie. It's been uh, it's been a fun week. What you're saying is it's time to retake all of your social media profile pictures and really revamp your look and feel for your personal brand. Is that what's uh, going on? Yeah, I'm like uh, actually probably two weeks too late for Halloween. This would have been like perfect. I mean, if it only had happened two weeks ago, this would have been like perfectly timed. There you go. Next time you got to time your your sicknesses and pop blood vessels a little better. Uh, but we got a lot of stuff uh, to cover today. What are we hitting first? So first up is our infographic of the week, and this is a good one. I think uh, it's called, How Much Do Small Businesses Spend on Social Media? And I thought it's interesting because, especially with small businesses, it's often an area that gets ignored a little bit. You know, the the bigger companies, they're talking about, oh, we've got a 20-person social media team, and we've got this, and we've got that. And so you can kind of figure, all right, well, that's a pretty large uh, operation. That's a lot of expense going into that. But if you're a small business, sometimes it's a little hard to figure out, you know, am I doing more than the average? Am I doing less than the average? Where do I stack up? And so there's a lot of interesting data coming out of this. Uh, and the first of which, you know, starting really basic, it basically said 43% of small businesses spend six or more hours per week on social media, and 25% spend six to 10 hours per week, with 11% spending 11 to 20 hours, and then 7% actually spending more than 21 hours per week. So if you add that up, um, you know, I think it seems like most businesses, you're looking at 68%, spend somewhere between zero and 10 hours a week, which seems pretty reasonable. That's probably, you know, an hour to two per working day. Uh, I'd imagine that spread out throughout the day. And I, I felt like that was about right. I think that, you know, I was kind of surprised actually to see some of the small businesses saying they're spending 7% uh, at 21 plus hours per week. That caught me off guard a little bit. I figured it would be more in the lower percentages. So, you know, I think if you're a small business and you're looking at yourself saying, all right, well, I'm spending, you know, an hour a day or an hour and a half per day, that puts you right at the norm. So, you know, you're you're not falling behind. You're not, uh, you know, you're not competing against a huge percentage of companies that are doing a lot more than that. I think, you know, you can sort of rest assured that that's probably a a good amount of time to be spending on it, while still balancing all of the other things that you need to do as the you know manager, owner, operator of a small business. Did that align with what you would have expected, Adam? Uh, yeah, but I think that I would also caution folks to say that you know th- this isn't like the the, the formula per se uh, for for other folks to follow. I think one of the things that people are always fearful of is exactly how long. Uh, they might have to spend on social media, especially small businesses, in order to really uh, be effective. And, I, and I'd say, um, you know, there's still – obviously, the more that you spend, the more the more time you spend, the more opportunity that you have to, to reap a reward from it. But um, there's, you know, working harder and working smarter. And so uh, there's likely a lot of these folks that haven't really looked at how – to retool or polish their approach to using social media, uh, using some sort of tools or doing it in a more formal fashion in order to really reduce the time that they're spending and more effectively use social media for whatever their reason is, you know, marketing or uh, lead generation and such. Yeah, and that actually lends itself nicely to the next point, which is one third of CEOs slash owners slash proprietors want to be spending less time on social media. So these are folks that feel like maybe they've extended themselves a little too far. Maybe there was a lot of pressure previously to 
really push and advance in social media. And now they're thinking, eh, you know, maybe it's time to dial it back. Maybe I'm not seeing the return on the investment that I should, which I think could be addressed by finding ways of automating it or finding tools that really speed up that process so that in the same amount of time or less time, you're able to do the same amount of interaction in terms of social media. Um, 66% of businesses reported spending more time on social media compared to a year ago. So there are still plenty of businesses that are increasing the amount of time they're spending on it, which hopefully they're doing in response to seeing positive outcome of their social media usage. Uh, but you know, it is on the rise. It, it by no means has reached a plateau. So I think there's still plenty of room for growth there. 55% of small businesses have a blog. This number came in a little higher than I would have imagined, actually. Um, you know, I, I think it's good. I think that a blog is a very smart choice. We've talked a lot in the past about owning your own channels, owning your own content, and the blog is the number one way of doing that. And so I think seeing more than half of small businesses having a blog, that's a, a strong sign. And I think that you know, it sort of shows that if you don't yet have a blog, maybe it's time to consider at least starting something up. You know, you can get involved easily with something like a Tumblr blog where there's not a lot of setup, there's not a lot of time involved to actually post new content, but you're out there, you're part of that conversation, and you're creating content that could have a lot of potential value. Uh, And then, you know, looking at what's valuable for your time, it said that finding and posting content is actually the most time-consuming Uh, And then the least time consuming is responding to questions. So this is interesting. I think sometimes this is probably reversed for larger businesses. So smaller businesses can definitely take advantage of the fact that, you know, the, the person who's handling these questions is sometimes the CEO or the owner. There is no chain of command. The person sees a comment, they can respond directly to it versus finding and posting content. You really have to go out there. You have to find things that are appropriate for your audience. You have to position it to your audience, that's definitely something that's a little more time consuming. So I think small businesses should really look at responding to questions and engaging on a one to one level as an opportunity where you have an advantage that a larger company does not and you can really take advantage of that, uh, you know, that fact and that ease of posting and ease of the lack of approval process that you're provided. Uh, Anything stand out specifically from this infographic that you wanted to call out, Adam? Uh, well, well, based on what you were just talking about, I mean, when you say responding to questions is uh, is the easiest, and finding and posting con is the content is the hardest. Uh, I'd say that there's an opportunity to take the questions that you respond to and turn them into content. So identify that the, the the questions that people are having and the issues that people are seeing and find ways of saying, well, you know, I'm sure that out of every question you have, there's probably 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 other folks that have very similar questions. Sometimes not, but, you know, examine that stuff. And not every single uh, post uh, or, or piece of content you publish has to be a masterpiece. Uh, and so I think there's some opportunities on the one side of the spectrum to help serve the other side of, that, of the spectrum. Uh, and so I, I think for marketers and for folks who are helping businesses with social media who are coming in and helping these business owners and such. I think there's a number of opportunities that are pointed out here, including the fact that one out of every three CEOs wants to spend less time. How can you help take advantage of that opportunity to build in processes and help them introduce them to tools to uh, to do that or uh, help them find uh, methods and processes that help folks identify really awesome content uh, that they could that they could you know write and create and and, and post uh, to their audiences because it seems to be the most time consuming, but obviously reaps a lot of rewards. So I think there's some opportunities for in, independent um, marketers and consultants here to help out some of these small businesses. Yeah, definitely. And as always, we will include a link to this infographic in the show notes. Definitely encourage you to check it out. There's a lot of additional information here that we didn't get a chance to cover, including looking at some of the major platforms and how many businesses are using them, how much focus they're putting on those channels. So you can really get a sense for, you know, if I don't have a Google Plus page, does that put me in the minority, that sort of thing. So check out the show notes. This will be available at solomoshow.com. And uh, you can look over that full infographic and really dive deep into some of the great data that gets shared. So, Corey, what's uh, powering the Internet, huh? That's the question next. Exactly. So our next topic is actually another infographic, but we decided to convert it into our main topic because I I think that really the infographic in this case could have just been a chart. They decided to give it uh, some fancy colors and some icons, but 
really it boils down to a chart. So this was an interesting data source. It's a website called Flippa, F-L-I-P-P-A. Flippa is the leading online marketplace for buying and selling websites. So if you own a website and you're looking to get out of the business or you know, you've been running a blog for a while and you're thinking, oh, I'm just not that interested in it. I'd like to, you know, let somebody else have a crack at it. You can list your website on Flippa. And so what Flippa has done is tracked all of the websites bought and sold on their platform over the past year. And we're actually able to come up with some really interesting data for what the preferred platforms and preferred services that are being used to power a lot of the websites going through their system. And they broke it out into three of the main topics that are probably interesting to our listeners, which is e-commerce, CMS, or oftentimes better known as a blogging platform, and forums. And starting right from the top, so e-commerce, the number one e-commerce platform is actually Shopify with 39.8%, followed by Magneto at 18.3%. Or Magento. Magento. Magento at 18.3%. That's I, Every time I read it, I'm uh, my, the X-Men fan in me comes out and I say Magneto as well. <laughs> I, maybe they should rename it. I like Magneto a little better. <laughs> uh, and then we got OpenCart at 13.4% in third place, followed with smaller percentages by Big Commerce, Yahoo Store, and then Other. Uh, other actually representing 17%. So that's just kind of smaller platforms. Uh, and that was the websites being... Uh, requested. So people that are looking to buy websites, there's a little bit of a shift if you're looking at the supply. So people that have built websites and are now selling them. Magneto actually came out on top, followed by OpenCart and followed by Shopify. So looking at some of those differences, I think is interesting. The number one in-demand commerce platform was Shopify, though it was only the number three supplied platform. So it seems like Shopify is an easy system to run, an easy system to manage, and probably something that has increased in popularity recently. And so a lot of people are looking for that. And it's taking a while to catch up as some of these legacy systems get, uh, you know, bought and sold and traded off. I would uh, I would concur with that, Corey. Uh, in, in our experience, we've worked with uh, Magento in the past. And uh, it's been great. Magento is really robust, but it, it really isn't for some of the more medium and smaller size companies. Um, there's a lot to it when it comes to trying to customize it to your liking, um, in my opinion, when it comes to some of our clients. And Shopify has really done a pretty awesome job of trying to make things um almost as robust as Magento, uh, but a bit easier to manage and, and maintain. And we've seen it uh, become something that people are, are more more likely to request or be familiar with. And um, we ourselves, we're pretty picky about what we recommend to folks. We don't just kind of you know spin a wheel and whatever happens to show up. And, and Shopify has been one that we've been starting to point, to, uh, point folks to as well. Ah, very nice. Um, Shopify, they actually did a breakdown of the change in demand year over year. And Shopify Shopify was at the top of that chart with a 35% increase in demand, while Magento was at the very bottom of that list with a 31% decrease in demand. So the two that we just mentioned, one was the significant winner, one was a significant loser year over year. So I would say based on this data, um, and you know, of course, there's various ways of interpreting this, but based on this data, if I was to start up an e-commerce website or add e-commerce to an existing website, I would probably be looking to Shopify as the platform to host that on. So, and by the, by the way, uh, Magento, uh, not, not I mean, I think within two years or three years of, of being really an open source project um, by you know a group of folks was purchased by eBay and you know slash PayPal, uh, and so that's the current owner. And I'm not sure if that had anything to do with either you know the the like or dislike of its current product development or uh, or you know people's um, lack of affinity for one specific uh, large platform or, or company of choice really wanting to kind of stay independent, which, which you know, currently is what Shopify is. Jumping down a little bit to the content management system, this one was staggering. This one really, uh, I don't know that I was surprised by it, but I was definitely impressed by the dominance that WordPress has over all other platforms. So WordPress, both in terms of demand and supply, basically represents between 82 and 88% of all websites that are going through the Flippa system. And there really wasn't a change year over year. So 2011, 2010, WordPress really was the top blogging platform. It beat out Joomla, Drupal, Blogger, Tumblr, 
plig and then other at 3.4 percent so really by and large if you're going to have a blog and you're going to self-host it wordpress is the way to go Tumblr, I think you can't really look at these numbers as a viable judge of Tumblr's effectiveness because my guess would be a lot of Tumblr represents personal sites. It's not something where you're you're building up a a website that you would then sell to someone else. So I think if you're a brand and you're considering where to put your content, I would leave Tumblr in that consideration set. But if you're looking for really a full featured content management system, a full featured blogging platform, at this point, WordPress is just the default. There were, you know, movable type was around at one point, uh, but I think it's just fallen off recently and WordPress has really established, established itself as the dominant player in the CMS marketplace. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and 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 WordPress being even self-hosted uh, versus third-party hosted makes a big difference. I mean, the ones that we're talking about here, the first three, uh, WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal are all self-hosted. Uh, WordPress has a, a third-party hosted version initially, but it, primarily, I'm sure most of these are are the self-hosted installs, which means you take WordPress, you know, code and software and install it on your own hosting environment that you've grabbed from someplace else, uh, versus just simply signing up and getting a username and password at WordPress.com, and then the rest all kind of fall off the the wayside, which are are third-party hosted, including Tumblr. And and um, I agree with you on Tumblr. I mean, I, I don't see it as a as a content management system that's on par with the ones above, I think there's a certain dynamic to it and network uh, effect that is con- with with it being connected to other uh, parts of the Tumblr community that make a huge difference um, in in using it for certain types of content and certain types of brands and, and content distribution. So that's, I think, where the numbers are playing here. The last one we'll cover, and we'll run through this kind of quick because I don't know that it applies to a lot of the listeners here, but... They did talk about forums, and again, vBulletin by far was the leading forum provider. Uh, vBulletin was anywhere between 91 and 93% of the platforms. Uh, underneath that was MyBB, PHPBB, and then Other. So essentially, if you're going to start up a forum, if you're going to create a customer portal, and it's going to be self-hosted, you're probably going to go with vBulletin. That's the dominant player. It's the one that everyone's using. It's going to have the most support. There are you know, alternatives. If you were going to set up a forum inside of Facebook, there's providers that just focus on that. But if you're doing a self-hosted forum, you know, vBulletin definitely looks like the way to go. And so I wanted to transition that into why looking at these types of information is interesting and useful to a brand. And I think part of why you want to go with a leader in the space, one of the popular platforms, a platform that's being used heavily, is that there's going to be more support for it, and especially more kind of free and open source support. So something like a vBulletin, something like a WordPress, the support community is really strong for those. So if you have an issue, if you have a question, if you're looking for ways to customize your instance of that platform, it's going to be a lot easier to just Google the problem that you're having and say, you know, why doesn't X work? And you'll find other people that have had that problem and hopefully had that problem solved online in a public way. And so it makes the platform a lot easier to troubleshoot, a lot easier to customize. It's it's a language that others are going to be able to speak. So, you know, if you have a V bulletin problem, there are other people that are out there that know a lot of the ins and outs of vBulletin and can help you and aren't going to charge you an arm and a leg to try to keep vBulletin up and running versus something like a, you know, a PHP BB at 2.1%. There aren't a lot of folks out there that know how to keep that going. And so if you, you know, really put a lot of effort into a, a PHP BB forum, you're going to find yourself having to track down somebody that knows how to manage that, and they're probably going to charge you more than somebody would to just keep a vBulletin platform up and running. So I thought that was definitely one of the bigger reasons for paying attention to some of these statistics. You know, you look at something like inside of the CMS platform, Joomla at 4.6%, you're like, all right, well, some people are using it. It you know, probably has some advantages to it, but then you look at WordPress at 80%, and just the sheer volume that that represents in terms of users, in terms of opportunities to get your problem solved, to get your you know customization done cheaper, faster, easier, I think that that lends itself well to going with the leader and the you know 
one that has the bigger percentage of market share. Would you agree with that, Adam? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely would. I mean, if you just take a quick example of uh, a client that came to us and uh, they had a, a content management system themselves. It was a custom one. It wasn't one of these uh, available ones uh, for their site, and they were using Ruby on Rails, which is um, a, a platform for, for development, um, <clears throat> for coding and such. And so in order to, to use Ruby on Rails, you need to have uh, somebody who's familiar with that in order to work with it. And we ourselves do not work with Ruby on, on Rails. Uh, we prefer to work with something that's a little bit more widely supported, just like you said, which is PHP. Um, and uh, they essentially were, were finding it very, very, very hard to find somebody, although the system, the, the, the content management system was maybe more flexible or whatever the case is, they felt that it was more stable. The previous developer kind of chose it based on their familiarity, but left them in a way high and dry because now they were searching for a developer, which uh, Ruby developers are uh, far and few between in comparison to some of the other platforms, and they, they're more expensive. And so it kind of left them in a, in a lurch trying to find a way to ma- maintain uh, this platform, with which at release time may have been you know really awesome, but now when they want to move and, and groove in a different direction or make some adjustments, they're stuck. Definitely some great data to keep in your back pocket, and if you happen to be at one point looking to launch an e-commerce platform or get a blog up and running, you know, refer to this, take a look at what the leaders in the space are. Maybe a new platform will have emerged, and by the time you're trying to get one of these up and running, that will have taken over. But I think keep in mind to try to figure out what the dominant player in the space is, what the leading platform is. And put your focus, put your energy, put your time towards that because it's going to be easier in the long term than going with one of these smaller platforms that just doesn't have the same level of support as the bigger platforms do. All right, so speaking of platforms, the next thing we're going to talk about here is a tool review of LaunchRock. So LaunchRock is a service that allows new startups, new companies, new businesses to start to grow an audience before they really have a larger product to put in front of people. Uh, It was designed primarily for internet startups as a way of generating interest in a product. And, you know, it was pretty heavily used for a while. A lot of companies were putting up launch rock pages. It's sort of a, it's a landing page that allows you to collect email addresses from people that are interested in your company. Um, You know, it was used a lot of times for internet companies, but it could certainly be used for, getting email addresses of people that are interested in a new bar that's opening up or a new restaurant or a new movie theater. There's all sorts of businesses that could potentially put something like this into play. And as a result of that, LaunchRock recently relaunched with a variety of themes and advanced landing pages that are really customized to different types of businesses. So whereas LaunchRock 1.0 was focused on just a sign-up sheet and just collecting email addresses, LaunchRock 2.0 is really focused on customizing the experience to the type of business that you're trying to get off the ground. And I really like LaunchRock. I think that, you know, it is a it's a relatively simple service. I'm not going to lie. It's not like it's doing a whole bunch. It's basically collecting email addresses for you and allowing you to just kind of test an idea. You can put a logo out there. You can put a little description and see if people are willing to sign up for it. But at the same time, it's done very well. So the code is strong. It's They actually optimized all the code to make sure the sites run really quickly. It has full analytics, and so you can get a feel for who's coming to this page, how many people are actually submitting their email address, how many people aren't submitting their email address, where is that traffic coming from. And then it's all customizable, and so you can apply your own theme, you can add your own logo, you can really make it feel like the way you want it to feel for your own brand. So I, you know, I'm a big fan of LaunchRock. I've actually used it when I was working on an application. I used LaunchRock as a way of just building up an initial email list for that application to find out who was interested in it, who wanted to know more. And it it helps that when you finally do, you know, push the big red button and launch your product, you already have a list built up of people that are really interested in what you've got going. And so I think for a company that's really in that initial stage of, you know, you're working behind the scenes, you're not quite ready to go public, but you've got enough ready that you can 
tease people a little bit and get people interested in what you're working on, I think Launch Rock is a great solution to, you know, peel back the curtain a little bit and say, hey, I'm I'm not quite ready to go public, but I am ready to let you know what I'm working on. And, you know, if you're interested in what I'm doing, feel free to sign up. And as soon as I know more, I can give you more information. Um, Adam, have you had any experience with Launch Rock? And if so, what's your take on it? Yeah, actually, uh, I was a user early on and, and used it to, to launch two different things. You, you mentioned uh, using it for you know internet-based companies, and so I helped uh, a company do that. And then uh, the the other thing was I, I used it to help somebody uh, launch a book. So uh, the dynamics of it, beyond what you were talking about, Corey, and, and being able to collect emails, is is it also has a, a very kind of it tries to drive vir- virality, uh, the pass along effect with with social media, um, social networks, and so when you sign up, it gives you a page that says, you know, here's your unique Facebook or Twitter or, or email link that you could share with folks, and when you do, if you do it, you know, uh, if you get three other people to sign up based off of this link, then we'll we'll give you early access to something, or we'll unlock something for. You or we'll give you a, a nice gift or something like that, um, and so that that's part of the metrics where it will show you who are the folks that actually drove not just the most visits but the most people who to actually sign up based on those unique links. Um, and so we did that for successfully, I think, for uh, a book launch where the person had intended on not even. Uh, doing anything with their website until it was very close to the time that the book was uh, was uh, released, and, and I said, "Well, why why wait? If there's people that are potentially interested in it, why not get the buzz moving?" Now. And then when the book is available for, for pre-order, that's when, you know, you can do a little bit more of an unveiling. Uh, and so we were able to get kind of a, a, an initial list seated of folks that were interested in the book and uh, and did it by incentivizing people to say that, you know, uh, for whoever was able to, to get the most people to sign up or whatever. I forgot exactly what it was, but they would end up uh, being entered to, to win one of three or four different packages of autographed books that they had uh, that the author was going to have available. So I think anybody who, you know, you were talking about a restaurant or a bar or a theater or something like that. I mean, you can incentivize people with almost anything and just try to get the buzz going. I mean, the worst case scenario is you, you, you don't get anybody really hyped at that very moment because they're waiting for a full entire website. But if you don't do that, what do you do? You have no sign up. You're not building any buzz and you don't have email addresses, which you could then use to say, we're now available. Go tell people. We have a Facebook page. Whatever it is that you want to announce when you're ready. This goes back to many episodes ago um, where we we, we called uh, build your audience, right, or build your community. Yeah, and and making sure that you have a community ready ahead of time, not suddenly going, shoot, it's time to release this product or whatever. Now let's find a way to build our audience. Um, the, the thing I'm happy in seeing currently is that they're really revamping their platform because, you know, you were saying kind of they don't really do anything super fancy. At the time, they were one of the first that really did it. But there were a lot, to be honest, of, fa- of, of WordPress themes that were coming out that were doing a lot of the functionality minus some of the analytics and some of the other things that are, that are out there with launch rock. And so I'm really glad to see that they've decided to step back and really differentiate what they're doing and add a lot of, uh, st- a lot of things that make launch rock stand on their own, on its own. And I'm excited to try out the new platform when they finally, uh, release it. They, they do have it available to new folks who want to sign up for it. They will be pushing it out to the folks who already have been using it uh, pretty soon, it sounds like, based on the blog post that we'll link to. One thing to keep in mind is that LaunchRock is not going to do the work for you. So they will help you get this page up and running. But in terms of actually getting people to the page and getting people to be aware of the product or the company that you're trying to launch, that's still work that you have to do. So LaunchRock provides a great platform, a great landing page to send people to, but you still do need to go out, do some PR, think a little bit about your branding and your story that you're trying to trying to tell and find ways of bringing that audience in. Adam, you mentioned a sweepstakes. I think that's a great idea. You know, you want to find these influential users, you want to incentivize them to invite friends. You you still have to do all of that work, but putting the work on top of a great platform like LaunchRock definitely makes it easier and it definitely takes one of the worries away of is the code going to work? Is the site going to stay up? 
you know, you can stop worrying about that. You can put your focus on bringing in an audience, making sure your story's right, making sure the initial brand impression is the way that you want it to be. So I think LaunchRock is a great tool to help in that process, but you do need to keep in mind that it's not, uh, you know, some sort of magic magic formula that's just going to make a launch process you know a guaranteed success you still do need to do the work and put some effort into building up an audience it's a tool right we this is a tool review so this is a tool you have to think about in your toolbox and experiment and think about it brainstorm back away before you actually decide to kick kick off something with it and really think creatively about how you could end up using this. I mean, I would not have thought about using it for a book had I just simply looked at what it had at face value initially and and uh, used it. I thought, you know, a little bit out of the box in that sense. And uh, I think that it works great for that. And as Corey was saying with those other places, again, theaters and restaurants and so on, I think all of those uh, have an opportunity to use Launch Rock in their own way and even more so with the new platform. All right. Well, with that, it is time for... The lightning round. Well, there's actually been a lot of lightning and thunder over here. I think you saw some, maybe you saw some of my photos on Facebook. I did, yes. So if you can uh, just record some of those sounds, we'll use those to bring some real lightning to the lightning oh, round. Oh, man, I missed out. Well, actually, then maybe they'll be happening again on Saturday. So that, that's what I'll do. I will stand out and hold on to the aluminum rail of the balcony recording lightning and thunder sounds. <laughs> nice. That sounds safe. <laughs> All right, so I've got 60 seconds on the clock, and I'll go ahead and start with the first story. So ready and go. First story is YouTube pulling the plug on 60% of their programming deals. So we talked a little bit about this program previously where YouTube was going out, they were finding these up-and-coming episodes, and they were actually sponsoring them and kind of giving them advances the way that a author would. So Some of these channels were getting upwards of a million dollars to produce content. The idea was you were going to produce more episodic content and really enable YouTube to take on some of the cable companies. Well, one year into that program, they've evaluated the channels that they funded, and they're actually cutting back on 60% of those channels. So, you know, the point that I thought was interesting out of this is even with a million dollars in support, an established audience, you know, YouTube backing you, uh, you know, potentially giving you preferred ranking and things like search results, it's still hard to grow that audience. There's still a lot of work that goes into making great content. And, you know, for brands, I think that that proves that you really have to put some effort into making great content. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. What is your take on YouTube pulling the plug on some of their premium channels? Ready and go. So uh, in comparison to, say, the TV or television show, rather than, say, completely canceling the show, what they're really doing is just removing support for it, uh, which is, like Corey was saying, it could be a pretty big deal depending on if they're giving them preferred ranking and so on. It's, it's all about visibility. Um, I, I think the, the, the thing for, for brands to keep in mind when it comes to, pr- say, producing um, maybe episodic content to help uh, with content marketing or help with their visibility is that you don't need to be a million dollars channel in order to have a return on investment but you know and that's based on every company you're gonna have to take a look at that for yourself um, but like like Corey said the amount of effort that it takes uh, even if you just put a ton of money into it, it it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be successful you really want to take a look at things that make uh, that add value to your to your audience um, it'll be interesting here as the new changes that YouTube has made overall to their site uh, if, if that'll impact things in 2013. Well said, well said. So, putting 60 seconds back on the clock, let's jump into topic number two. Ready and go. So, topic number two is Google rolling out indoor Google Maps. This is an interesting update. They're actually positioning it as something they're rolling out ahead of the holiday season. So, as people head out and about to do their holiday shopping... Google is now going to enable indoor location mapping for certain businesses. And in the blog post, they highlight malls or bigger, you know, JCPenney style shopping areas. And the thing that's interesting most to me about this is that it's not full indoor mapping. It's sort of a tease of the potential of indoor mapping. So it's enabled for any Android smartphone, which means that it's not based on, you know, a new chip or a new technology. It's it's just taking the existing maps that they have and sort of applying them to your Google application and 
trying to, to take a best guess at where inside of this mall you may be. It hasn't quite reached the ideal indoor mapping nirvana, but it's it's at least a step in the right direction towards, you know, really great indoor mapping. All right, Adam, do you think this is the beginning of the future of indoor mapping, or is this just a small step towards that future? Ready and go. So I've always thought years and years ago that the uh, holy grail of, of, of location-based stuff was when uh, was being able to find the cereal aisle in the local grocery store. Uh, I, I think like being able to find something in a, a smaller, more hyper-local place uh, was always something that was was interesting and I think um, helpful to folks, and and that's happening more. Uh, that, that that kind of effort is happening now, where the world has been mapped, or is is for the most part been mapped, um, and now people are mapping indoors and much uh, smaller spaces. There was something that I saw recently shared by Mark Evans of the Social Local Conference, uh, where something in the billion dollar, multiple billion dollar range uh, of, of money has being is currently being invested in mapping indoors over the next couple of years. So I assume that this will become uh, a much more useful thing over the next couple holidays yeah definitely something to pay attention to as it evolves all right 60 seconds back on the clock let's dive into story number three so this is a new feature being rolled out by airbnb the vacation rental service that allows you to list your house for sale or actually rent out other people's homes And what they've done is picked out neighborhoods and really created almost like a travel guide for that neighborhood. So it tells you a little bit about what the neighborhood is. It gives you a lot of images and great scenes from that neighborhood. And if you're looking to travel to a place like San Francisco or New York, two of the launch neighborhoods, it really gives you a sense for what you're going to be looking for. You know, is that area a good fit? I think it's great. It's encouraging people to browse around, to imagine places, to get inspired, you know, kind of collecting all these different places of, oh, I'd love to stay there and I'd love to check that out. It's getting people to explore Airbnb and it's really positioning themselves as something unique. I think that this is something that other travel and other vacation companies can't offer and it's a smart move by Airbnb to take advantage of that. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. What's your take on the Airbnb neighborhoods feature? Ready and go. Uh, I think it's pretty nifty. I mean, I think they've said directly in the blog post that it's a much more kind of visual and engaging way of doing it. And I I think um, it's a model that it seems I didn't really get to see anything beyond the video and some of the stuff that it had in the the page that was talking about the feature. Uh, but based on what it showed, uh, it's, this is something that any sort of travel site or, or um, you know, a site representing a, a tourist destination or uh, even a real estate, this is like the way that it should be. And so uh, I think uh, Airbnb did an awesome job of really um, looking at what was going to be the next generation of, of tools or, or what was how, how could they – what was the next generation going to look like when it came to attracting folks and showing them around the community? I think they were they're spot on with what they've done. All right. You have saved us from the lightning round sound with six seconds to go. Last story of the lightning round for today is Facebook testing ranked comments. Do you want to start us off with this one? Sure. I'll go for it. And go. So, uh... Facebook is is starting to do some testing on some pages with rank comments. Rank comments meaning that when you like something, it doesn't just show likes; it actually helps the the the, the comment rise or fall uh, in the, in all the comments that are there based on uh, how many likes that it has. Kind of like Dig used to, if you're familiar with Dig.com or even Reddit right now. Um, and uh, they also are adding a little bit of a threaded conversation thing happening. So rather than just being able to leave a comment now there's some replying that can happen, which does happen on their commenting platform, but not necessarily on the on-page comments. Uh, And so I see this as being a way for uh, brands to gain some more insights to the things that have been liked the most that have risen to the top, and also potentially to use it as a way to to run contests and and things based on, uh, you know, ideas that are submitted and what people seem to like the most out of all the things that have been submitted on the page. All right, two seconds left. Bonus time. All right, 60 seconds back on the clock. Ready and go. So I think this is really interesting and definitely a smart and probably long overdue move on Facebook's behalf. 
Facebook in general, I think, has a has a better than average discourse. So because people's real names are there, it's associated with something that people put a lot of value towards, which is your Facebook profile. Unlike, say, maybe an anonymous forum name or something that you've created, but if needed, you could get rid of. People generally tend to write more intelligent, more thoughtful, more, you know, valuable comments. And especially on a brand page, which I think which I think is nice. Despite that, there still is the occasional person that puts nonsensical things or spam or just crappy comments. So hopefully what this is going to do, especially for Facebook pages, is start to push those down and push the valuable comments up. It'll enable people to, you know, put a little more thought into it in hopes of ranking well inside of the comments and I think could continue to increase the value of on-page comments. All right. Well, that was a excellent episode. And as always, we would love to hear from you if you have any questions, if you want to suggest a topic, if you want to give feedback, or even if you want to just say hi. We definitely encourage that. We'd love to get to know our audience better. Uh, we've already met quite a few of you. We've already you know, exchanged Twitter messages back and forth, and we really enjoy that. So feel free to get in touch with us. One of the ways and probably the easiest way is via Twitter. We're both available at Solo Mo Show, or you can reach myself directly. I'm at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. You can also email the both of us. Our show email is solomoshow at gmail.com. That's S-O-L-O-M-O-S-H-O-W at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook page. Just search Facebook for Solo Mo Show, where we share some of the things that we've uh, found throughout the week and um, hope that you'll jump on there and comment on those and tell us what you think of those topics. We're also on Google Plus and have an account on Pinterest where we have multiple boards where you can pin uh, our shows, uh, our YouTube version of our shows, so you can repin those to your heart's delight. And as always, all of the links that we discussed today, as well as the links that we just mentioned to our social channels, can be found in the show notes. The easiest way to view the show notes is to just go to solomoshow.com. There you'll find a blog post for each of the episodes that we do, which includes all of the show notes. You can also go to our YouTube channel, and beneath each of the videos is a reposting of the show notes. So it's a way for you to click through, really take a deep dive into each of the stories that we're talking about, and it's our way of providing a little extra value. So if you liked one of the topics and you want to dive deeper, you want to learn a little bit more about that, check it out in the show notes, and it should be you know pretty easy to find the appropriate link, and sometimes there's even links that we throw in there that we don't get a chance to talk about on the show that allow you to, again, take a deeper dive into that topic. So definitely check that out. And as always, if you do have a spare moment and haven't yet rated us in iTunes, we would really appreciate it if you did that. We created a link on solomoshow.com that actually walks you through the review process. So again, it only takes about 30 seconds to find the show on iTunes and give it a rating, and it helps us to reach a new audience and enable others to discover the show. So we would really appreciate it. And with that, we will call this episode a wrap and hope that you come back next week for another great episode of The Solo Mo Show. Take care.